had all the makings of a Hollywood idol. Good looks, sex appeal, charm, and ambition. By the time he was 26, Hexham had already starred in two TV series, a movie of the week, and a feature film. And the kid had only been in Tinseltown three years. I don't think I ever met anyone that wanted stardom more than John Eric and was willing to work for it. He's got a lot of charisma. I, I know that um, everybody who sees him thinks that he's uh, all the girls, young girls think that he's just terrific. John Eric was really living his dreams. People were really seeing him as the next big star. No question about it, John Eric Hexham was on the Hollywood fast track. Little did he know he was racing toward disaster. I wrote in my journal, John Eric is like a time bomb that's ticking and I don't know when he's going to go off. On this episode of Mysteries and Scandals, we'll examine the action-packed career of actor John Eric Hexham and the bizarre accident that brought it all to a sudden halt. Russian roulette. That was what I, that I heard. Uh, I think it was reported that way. Here is this brief, bright star. And boom, gone. We'll also uncover the cover-up theories surrounding Hexham's final take. If there was some wrongdoing involved in this accident, how neat and tidy to shift the blame to a dead man. He was on a life support system, and he couldn't tell his story. It just seems very unlikely that, that the guy is going to put a gun to his head, even jokingly. Sounds like my kind of mystery. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me for a look at the life of the superstar that almost was, John Eric Hexham. On the afternoon of October 12, 1984, John Eric Hexham's Hollywood dream ended with a single gunshot. While working on the set of his new television series, Cover Up, the 26-year-old actor made a fatal mistake. Actress Jennifer O'Neill was Hexham's co-star in the action drama. Anybody that does a, a, a lead on a one-hour series, and we were co-leads, understands that you have no time and no life, and you just work these ridiculous hours, 14, 16, sometimes 18 hours a day. I believe that day he was very tired. A lot of times accidents just don't happen. They're when you're not paying attention. So I believe that John was overtired and overworked. Hexham's girlfriend, singer-actress E.G. Daly, had a strange feeling about that day. I knew something was weird. Felt really strongly that I needed to go see him. Went to the set. Just remember him arguing with someone. I think he was a bit angry about something, but I don't remember exactly what it was. Daly left the set and returned home, but two hours later, her intuition was confirmed. I got this phone call saying, you better run to the hospital, he hurt himself. I said, well, what do you mean he hurt his, himself? Did he get stitches? Did he cut himself? Did he hit his head? What happened? Well, I don't know, but you better just go to the hospital. No one was exactly sure what happened. Hexham had been shot in the temple at close range with a prop gun. The actor was bleeding from the head and was rushed to Beverly Hills Medical Center. Mino Palouse co-starred with John Eric in his earlier series, Voyagers, and the two remained close friends. The whole investigation shut down immediately. Case closed. It's an accident. Uh, I don't believe that. Actor Richard Anderson was on the set of Cover Up that day. Sad. That would be my best uh, observation of it. A mystery? Maybe. All that was certain was six days later, John Eric Hexham was declared brain dead and taken off life support. His charmed life cut tragically short. Within a matter of months, Hollywood's latest golden boy became a mere memory. John Eric Hexham archivist, Alan Carroll. It does feel like that. Swept under the carpet. I said, well, gee, this guy's going to drop off the face of the earth. He deserves better. That's what we're here for. Let's take it from the top. He was born in uh, Anglewood, New Jersey. And that would have been November 5th, 1957. His parents were Thorleaf Hexham, uh, who was a, uh, a cook on a boat from Norway. His mother was uh, Greta Paulson. Greta and Thorleaf split up in 1966 when Hexham was only nine. Greta moved John Eric and his older brother Gunnar to Tenafly, New Jersey. With her husband out of the picture, Greta worked two jobs to support her boys. Hexham himself seems to have been a fairly quiet but extremely personable guy. 
And during his junior year, he really kind of blossomed. He became the class president after being a complete wallflower for years. After graduating Tenafly High, John Eric enrolled in Michigan State University where he studied pre-med. We became involved in football without ever having played the sport. Within two months, he had talked himself onto the Michigan State team. By 1980, the confident senior was ready for a new challenge. 22-year-old Hexum decided to take a shot at acting. In a school with a long-established drama department, guy gets a one of three leads in Pippin. Sounds like the guy had guts. Hexum graduated college and headed to the Big Apple to follow his dream of becoming an actor. But the cocky young graduate had no idea that fame was right around the corner. So was tragedy. By 1981, 23-year-old John Eric Hexum was a struggling actor in New York City. He studied his craft by day and worked odd jobs by night. Not surprisingly, it was Hexum's chiseled face, not his talent, that first got him noticed. Christy Jenkins was a photographer and a friend. He had three jobs. He was a bartender in Times Square. He was also a bouncer at a creepy club, and he was a house cleaner. And he went to someone's home to clean their blinds. And the guy opened the door and went, <laughs> This guy should be a Hollywood star. Man, Hexum must have had a way with a feather duster. In September of 1981, he was on a plane bound for destiny. John Eric's cousin, Eric Paulson. So he calls me one day and he says, Eric, I'm moving to Hollywood. And I said, you out of your mind, Jack? I said, I'll never make your chance for a million to one. You're never going to make it. As I pushy a, a bit and idealistic and, and naive, yes, a bit but not totally. He was truly discovered in the old-fashioned way. In very short order, um, he had a screen test for Voyagers, won the role. He calls me up one day and he goes, I got a series. <laughs> and I said, you what? Voyagers was an adventure series on NBC. Not a bad gig for a rookie. The only problem was John Eric didn't know Jack about working in front of a camera. Mino Palouse was Hexum's co-star on the series. I was the old-timer on the set. I was 12 years old and I'd been acting since I was seven. And uh, John, you know, was brand new to it. The first day on the set, he pulled me over to the side and he said, how come you're on the other side of the camera? I said, John, this is your close-up. He didn't know how any of it worked. But Hexum was a quick study. He approached everything with single-mindedness. Everything, including love. I met John Eric because <laughs> I was doing this play. He came to the show. I went home that night, and then at 2 in the morning, I get this phone call. Ring, ring, ring. Hello. Hello. Um, who's this? This is John Eric. Really? What are you doing? What do you mean, what am I doing? <laughs> um, uh, well, me, I'm sleeping. I'm sleeping at 2 or 3 in the morning. What are you doing at 2 or 3 in the morning? He goes, well, I saw you in your play tonight, and I've absolutely fallen in love with you. Really? And I have to come pick you up at the show and take you out to, to dinner tomorrow night. I'm coming to your show again tomorrow. Really? Well, okay. <laughs> Hexam and Daly became an item. What's not to, what was not to love about him? He was like a kid in a, in a grown man bo body. Even the way he, you know, he used his body was like he could do backflips. And he was this big man. He would do like a back handspring and you'd be like, oh. Lennon was John Eric's photographer. He says John Eric always remained very down to earth. His house was a dorm room. You know, he had a, 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 a few pieces of furniture. He had a black and white TV with a, a wire antenna. He never let any of it go to his head. He always thought it was funny. Uh, is it worth it? God, yes. Good. I'd, I'm having a great time. On Voyagers, if it wasn't spears and arrows, there were guns, there were bullets, lots of, uh, lots of, sh lots of shoot 'em up stuff. So he certainly had a uh, good familiarity with weapons on a set. They're guarded very closely by the prop masters and by the stunt coordinators. At least they're supposed to be guarded, but we're getting ahead of the story. Hexum was having fun enjoying his newfound fame and his new girlfriend, but he was also pushing himself very hard. Veteran actor Richard Anderson worked with Hexum on Cover Up. You're not in the real world when you're working in front of a camera, and the better you are at it, uh, the more in it you are, the more you, you, you know, the, the more you live in a different world. Maybe that was the problem. I mean, in the make-believe world of Hollywood, the good guys never lose. 
but John Eric Hexum was about to get a lethal dose of reality. <laughs> Eric Hexum was making a name for himself. After only a few months in Hollywood, John Eric snagged a lead role in a primetime series called Voyagers. Although the show tanked in the ratings, Hexum turned the heads of the sexy leading man. He did Voyagers for that year, and it was a titanic effort to keep it on. It was against 60 Minutes. They didn't actually cancel Voyagers until the 10th of July, uh, 1983. I like doing the show, and I want to do another show, and it, it helps me in that sense, so I'm appreciative. He, he was kind of worried, you know, because he, he knew that what, what happens, and a lot of times you get to be a star one day, and then all of a sudden nobody hires you again. So, I mean, that was a concern for him. Making of a male model was, was a good move for him. Five weeks after the cancellation of Voyagers, Hexum was cast opposite Joan Collins in a TV movie called The Making of a Male Model. The handsome 25-year-old had a chance to uh, flex his acting muscles, so to speak. Making of a Male Model, that's where his first huge stir. This was just a great male TNA film. Aaron Spelling, you know. <laughs> What do you know, we scored. The movie garnered the hunky Hexum some pretty decent reviews and some personal publicity. Uh, we love tragic heroes. I, I love Rocky, I love, I love that kind of, uh, kind of film and kind of character that, that, that fights to win but doesn't. Yeah, but it was great to watch him, you know, his career taking off and off and off. He was not at all egotistical about his good looks. He had this funky old car that was like, a collector's item car, but not like really expensive or anything, but he was not into the things you could buy with money. He wanted to make his career happen. And he did. After the TV movie, John Eric landed his second series, a CBS action adventure called Cover Up. Hexen was the star as an ex-Green Beret turned male model slash spy working on the cover for the CIA. Did you get that? Hey, it's Hollywood, folks. Uh, Jenny O'Neill was going to play the photographer and um, this new sensation John Eric Hexum was going to play the model surrounded by beautiful ladies. You had to deliver a full hour to go on the air every week. What I'm getting to here very simply is that you don't have any time for yourself and there's a great deal of stress involved. John also had a bigger than life uh, sense of himself. It was not unusual to come to work on Monday and he would have tales of how he chased a drunk driver down and, and did a citizen's arrest. I, th I think he believed his own press. No big deal. I'll get out of it. I'll just try and keep my shirt on and, and choose subsequent roles carefully. It was like a big tidal wave. It was like this huge thing that was happening in his career, but it started to just kind of swallow him up a little bit. A month earlier I wrote, John Eric is like a time bomb that's ticking and I don't know when he's going to go off. There was an element of out of control, tired. But he did complain quite a bit about the cover-up set. Um, the hours were always too long. Hexum's hectic lifestyle was beginning to get to him. Still, he remained playful on the set, even with the handguns. John Eric's co-star, Jennifer O'Neill, knew better than to fool around with guns. Two years before she did the series, O'Neill was accidentally shot. I thought the irony in my life was that I was playing a role where I had to use guns uh, every week. John would play with the guns and it, it, it was a bit of a rub between he and I because I, I would get angry if he was waving them around. I said, I don't want you pointing the gun at me. Uh, I don't want, I just, just keep the gun over there and I was pretty tough about it because they scared me. Cut to October 12th, 1984. The cast and crew of Cover Up were filming on stage 17 of the 20th Century Fox lot. They were shooting uh, the uh, seventh episode of, uh, of Cover Up, uh, Golden Opportunity. In this show, it is a requirement that he's got to mess around with a gun. He was really tired, so apparently he crashed on a bed in one of the sets. And he got up very groggy. He was very frustrated um, about the time. Procedure is always the gun is empty. There is never anything in the gun. And then before a shot that required any kind of you know, gunfire, the property master would come and say, I'm going to load it now. And he picked up the gun, and he was just twirling it around in his hand. And he was just messing about, kind of playing Russian roulette, kidding. He, had a, he always kidded with, the, with the, um, the crew. And he was playing with the gun and went like that. I 
blank gun, if you shoot it from like here, it probably would have been okay. If John would have shot it from here, it probably would have been okay. If he shot it from here, it probably would have been okay. I don't know for sure, but I know that it was there. And that's why the impact was strong enough to where it, it did, you know, the damage. The thing that's odd to me is that John Eric had used blank guns a million times. Supposedly, no one saw him get hurt. Well, why would he be playing around with the gun if no one was around to enjoy his playing? He liked an audience. But someone did see it happen. When we come back, a detailed account of John Eric Hexum's final moments. On October 12, 1984, 26-year-old actor John Eric Hexum was working on the set of the action adventure series cover-up when his charmed life turned tragic. I was in my trailer when it happened, and I believe it was around 4 o'clock in the afternoon. Frank Lowe was a drapery installer for the film industry. Lowe was on the set that day and explains what he saw. John Eric Hexum happened to be lying on the bed, and he was apparently, as I recall, loading and then unloading a revolver. And um, they took a break in shooting, and he remained seated on the bed. And they had closed the door. I was just outside of for just a, a few moments when there was a, a loud bang. Lowe burst through the door and saw Hexum's body lying on the bed. The property master working with Hexum at the time of the accident explained to Frank what happened. Apparently, Hexum had been fooling around with a prop gun. He unloaded all but, I guess, one, one round, and had spun it, and apparently, uh, what would appear to be a game of Russian roulette, put it up to his head and pulled the trigger. And uh, I don't think he had any idea in the world that it was going to go off. Stunned crew members reacted quickly. It was obvious that he was pretty badly injured. He had a hole in his temple where apparently the cotton wad had blown into his brain. A mother that he was breathing, and uh, as a few minutes went by, and uh, rather than wait for an ambulance, we were all in agreement to get him loaded in a wagon and take him to the nearest hospital. Hexum's cousin, Eric Paulson, remembers hearing the news from John Eric's mom. I said, Aunt Greta, what happened? And she said, and a little wad of that paper went into, into his skull and put a chip of the skull into his brain. I told her, I said, if he ever wakes up, I'm going to kill him for being so stupid. Hexum's friends and family raced to the hospital. I just looked at him laying there. He was on machines. I couldn't visibly see anything wrong with him. He looked just perfect. Like, get up. You know, wake up. It was such a waste. It was so sad. There was a week of like this agonizing week of, is he gonna make it, is he gonna make it? And I had nothing, I didn't know what to do with myself. I was like sleeping on, on the floor in the hospital. I was, didn't want to go home. They finally pulled him off life support, he was brain dead. And that was it, there was no funeral. Um, it was very hard, very hard time. Hexum's organs were donated to several patients awaiting transplants. What's kind of neat about it is there's still a little bit of part of, of John Eric alive. I mean, his heart is in some, some guy in Las Vegas, and his eyes and his corneas went to, uh, to help some, some young girl. But those closest to John Eric Hexum still find it tough to deal with the loss. I mean, it was so silly when one of the... I was so silly when one of the tab boys said that he had a death wish. I mean... <laughs> John Eric was a life wish. God, I haven't, I haven't cried about him in a long time. <laughs> I used to cry about him all the time. John Eric was so much a part of, of my Aunt Greta's life. I think if there had been anything suspect or odd about it, she'd have been all over it. I just thought it was just a stupid, stupid accident. I can't imagine him doing something like that, yet at the same time I can. I think people that can be very, it's, be very careless on a set and just to be playing with it and putting it, I mean, it should be treated as a real gun if it's got uh, gunpowder in it or wax or paper, whatever they made it with. I mean, these are guns. They can kill you. You have to be careful. Uh, under all circumstances, every second you're near them, they're lethal. It was stupid. The whole thing was nothing but a waste. When he dies, like part of me died. So, it's tough. Sometimes I still have a hard time comprehending that John Eric's gone. But on the other hand, I still remember him as my big, goofy cousin who got to be a movie star. 
I think John would like to be remembered as a star, and he was. A real Hollywood tragedy. You know, it's said that John Eric's ghost haunts stage 17 on the 20th Century Fox lot. And maybe Hexham isn't ready to quit just yet. I'm A.J. Benza. Join me the next time we take a stroll down the flip side of the Hollywood Walk of Fame.